Charles Chaplin was very secretive about the way he worked. He seldom allowed himself to be filmed while directing and gave few interviews encompassing his entire career or detailing his working methods. He explained his reticence by saying, if people know how it's done, all the magic goes. The outtakes from his 1936 classic comedy, Modern Times, no longer exist, with the exception of one short, unused scene. So it's only the production photography, the still photographs taken from Modern Times, that survives as the visual record of the making of this great film. The genesis of Modern Times is rooted in Chaplin's 16-month world tour following the premiere of City Lights in 1931. As he traveled, Chaplin saw firsthand the economic and political consequences of the Great Depression. His friendships and meetings with some of the most influential thinkers of the era, such as Winston Churchill, Albert Einstein, Bernard Shaw, Gandhi, and H.G. Wells, further shaped his thoughts. Chaplin wrote a series of articles about his trip titled A Comedian Sees the World, originally published in Woman's Home Companion from 1933 to 1934, which demonstrate his desire to address social and political issues. Upon his return to Los Angeles, Chaplin was initially at a loss as to what kind of film he would make. He explored once again the possibility of making a film about Napoleon Bonaparte, with Chaplin himself playing the little corporal. He engaged the young journalist Alistair Cook to research and develop a script. However, Chaplin's enthusiasm for the Napoleon project waned as his personal relationship with Paulette Goddard grew. He began to see her full potential as an actress, especially as a gamine to his little tramp, more so than as a Josephine to his Napoleon. And from this he began to envision a comedy that embraced such difficult subjects as riots, strikes, unemployment, poverty, and the tyranny of the machine. Modern times, like the great dictator that would follow, is steeped in the political and social realities of its time. Chaplin enjoyed an eight-year professional and private relationship with Paulette Goddard, his leading lady in modern times and the great dictator, and wife, though only in a common-law marriage. She was born Marion Goddard Levy in New York in 1910. Like Chaplin, she came from a broken home and supported herself at an early age. At 15, she was a Ziegfeld showgirl. It was during this period that she bleached her naturally chestnut-colored hair blonde and gave herself a new name, Paulette Goddard. At 17, she married a wealthy man twice her age. They divorced two years later, and Goddard traveled to Hollywood with her substantial divorce settlement. She had appeared in bit parts in films and was under contract to comedy producer Hal Roach when Chaplin met the 22-year-old starlet and divorcee in July 1932. He soon took her under his wing, helping her invest her money, encouraging her to return her hair to its natural color, buying up her contract to Hal Roach, and instilling a discipline in her with his coaching. He also invited her to live with him. Unlike Chaplin's former wives and love interests, Goddard did not fit the usual mold. She understood him from the start, and he treated her as an equal and as his companion. Inspired by their private relationship, Chaplin created the role of the gamine in modern times as a partner to the tramp. Chaplin clearly doted on Goddard, as these behind-the-scenes stills from the production show. The amount of beautifully composed close-ups she enjoys in the film, unusual for Chaplin, is also suggestive of their close bond. Chaplin's pairing of the tramp with the gamine is similar to Jackie Coogan in The Kid, and not a romantic interest which had been the pattern in Chaplin's films. This must have been on Chaplin's mind, as fittingly, during the period of modern times, Jackie Coogan visited Chaplin at his studios after many years, and together they watched The Kid in the studio's screening room. Another memory of the 1920s shaped Chaplin's new film. Chaplin had met Henry Ford and visited the assembly line at the Ford Auto Plant in October 1923, there he learned of healthy young men who had been hired away from their farms to work in factories in Detroit, but after several years on the assembly line, succumbed to nervous breakdowns. When Chaplin cast the part of the president of his factory, he chose actor Alan Garcia, who bore a strong resemblance to Henry Ford as well as to Alfred Abel, 
the actor who plays Freiderson, the autocratic founder of the megacity in Fritz Lang's 1927 classic, Metropolis. Chaplin began pre-production work on Modern Times in September 1933, and filming began on October 11, 1934, at his Hollywood studio and on location. Art director Charles Danny Hall supervised the construction of the impressive factory interiors in the studio based on his sketches. This sketch depicts a factory exterior. These behind-the-scenes stills are of Chaplin in costume in the factory cogs. The factory interior, called the dynamo set, was made of wood and rubber, painted to look like steel. The Tramp's misadventures at the factory include being volunteered to test a feeding machine, a time-saving device employed so that workers may continue working during their lunch breaks. This photograph, taken in October 1934, shows Chaplin rehearsing the feeding machine with assistant director Carter DeHaven at left. Note Chaplin's left hand. He manipulated the revolving table and mouth wiper himself with levers concealed underneath the table. The tramp is driven crazy by the monotonous work on the conveyor belt and rebels against the factory and his fellow workers. He assumes a pose as Pan, using two wrenches to suggest horns, a great comic moment. Chaplin so liked this bit of business that he often struck this pose for later photographs. Here we see Chaplin as Pan in 1953, acting up for the camera held by Una Chaplin, his fourth and final wife, outside their home in Switzerland. The stills reveal how Chaplin would replace actors in small roles if a performance wasn't immediately to his liking. Chaplin would retake, refine, and rework in his quest for perfection. In the prison sequence, Chaplin first hired Pat Harrington as the warden, seen here, before replacing him with John Ince, seen here. Similarly, Konstantin Romanoff, best remembered as the strong man in Harold Lloyd's 1927 masterpiece, The Kid Brother, was originally hired as the prison tough before being replaced by Dick Alexander. The prison scenes were further modified in later editing as the Breen office objected to some of the homosexual suggestiveness of Chaplin's original cut. One of the most charming aspects of modern times, as a valedictory to silent film, is Chaplin's comic pairing with Chester Conklin, a veteran of Chaplin's earliest comedies at the Keystone Film Company, Conklin worked three weeks to complete his scenes. Location filming was a relatively unencumbered exercise compared to a typical Hollywood production, as Chaplin did not have to worry about sound recording. In the silent days, all that was needed was a camera operator, a cinematographer, a lighting technician to handle reflectors, and the director. The location team was a little larger than that for modern times, but still much smaller than for other Hollywood features of the time. A key location shoot was Bluffside Drive in present-day Studio City. This was also Paulette Goddard's first scene filmed for the production. Of modern times, Paulette Goddard remembered late in life, that was my best film work, and it's still my favorite movie. Charlie could be difficult at times. Difficult, but charming. Modern Times was an education and a marvelous experience for me. Chaplin, as director and producer, found the new union demands and technical challenges of his production somewhat daunting. Chaplin tended to work longer days than on his previous films. In the last stages of Modern Times, Chaplin's concentration was so focused that he actually lived at the studio. Filming was completed on August 30th, 1935. 147 days were spent in actual filming, with 263 days of pre-production and post-production work. Amounting to 410 days total, the production schedule on Modern Times was actually the shortest for any Chaplin feature since his 1923 drama, A Woman of Paris. As a point of comparison, a typical A feature film of the period would have taken 40 to 50 production days to complete. The total production cost of modern times was $1.5 million. During the making of modern times, Chaplin's weekend getaway was typically his yacht, called the Panacea, with Santa Catalina Island as his destination. He also took great pleasure visiting with Charles Jr. and Sidney, his two sons from his marriage to Lita Gray Chaplin, his second wife. 
This photo shows Chaplin with his music and sound recording team at the United Artists Studios. The distinguished Hollywood composer and conductor Alfred Newman served as conductor with Eddie Powell as orchestrator and David Raxon assisting in the orchestrations and working directly with Chaplin for his musical input. The collaboration of these exceptional musicians produced what is generally considered to be Chaplin's finest musical score. Here are four sequences that were filmed, but later discarded. Except for the first, these sequences no longer exist except in still photographs. This still depicts the street crossing scene. It was one of Chaplin's favorite unused comedy sequences, and the one unused scene from modern times that survives in Chaplin's film archives. This image depicts a drunken Big Bill, played by Stanley Sanford, stealing silverware from the department store as an equally inebriated tramp, now a night watchman, looks on. This deleted scene captures the tramp's efforts to hide from the gamine news of the outbreak of war, and later the tramp serving as a soldier, marching off with a saddened gamine at his side. The most fascinating of the abandoned sequences is Chaplin's original idea to end the film with the gamine becoming a nun. Chaplin was experimenting with a way to match the emotional finale of City Lights. The sequence began with the tramp, recovered from another nervous breakdown, being visited by the gamine, who has become a nun during his convalescence. The nun, with her mother superior, visits the tramp in the hospital reception room on the day he is discharged. The tramp is bewildered by her transformation. A barrier has risen between the two friends. The tramp and the nun bid farewell at the entrance of the hospital, and the tramp takes to the open road alone. As the nun watches, her spirit, depicted as her old self in the tattered clothes of the gamine, appears and runs rampant, bounding after him, beckoning to him. But he does not see or feel her presence. He walks alone. This behind-the-scenes still depicts the more cheerful ending as it appears in the final film. The tramp and the gamine on a country road, hand in hand, walking off toward the horizon to pursue a better life. For the first time, the tramp has a companion by his side. After preview screenings in San Francisco and Glendale, California, the world premiere of Modern Times took place at the Rivoli Theater in New York City on February 5, 1936. A few celebrities on hand that night, Douglas Fairbanks, Cecil B. DeMille, and Ernst Lubitsch with Mervyn Leroy. After modern times, Goddard appeared in such excellent films as George Cukor's The Women and The Cat and the Canary, starring Bob Hope. The Great Dictator, her second and final film for Chaplin, was not the happy experience modern times had been for her. Goddard was frequently in tears at Chaplin's demanding direction, as he believed much would be expected from them both in his first all-talking production. The Great Dictator effectively ended their personal and professional relationship. Her later films include Jean Renoir's 1946 classic, The Diary of a Chambermaid. She subsequently married actor Burgess Meredith, then novelist Eric Maria Remarque, author of All Quiet on the Western Front, with whom she remained married until his death in 1970. Her later years were spent as a famously wealthy socialite, claiming such friends as artist Andy Warhol and author Truman Capote. Although Chaplin and Goddard both resided in Switzerland in later years, they never met by design. We live on different mountains, was Goddard's explanation. She did seek Chaplin out at the Film Society at Lincoln Center's tribute to Chaplin in New York City in 1972, where Goddard approached Chaplin at a reception with their old favorite greeting for each other. Hello, baby. Chaplin's eyes, filled with tears, replied, Oh, my little baby. Yes, Goddard responded, your only little baby. It was their last meeting. Goddard died in 1990, leaving Remark's literary estate and $20 million to New York University. The production photography on Modern Times was the work of two people, an individual named Stern, as well as Max Munn Autry. Over 700 stills were taken using both 8x10 inch and 4x5 inch nitrate negatives, an enormous quantity of large format photography as compared to the typical Hollywood film of the time. They include scene stills, 
behind-the-scenes stills, portraits, wardrobe and makeup tests, set reference, and location reference shots. Unfortunately, whole scenes are not represented as Chaplin did not like to reveal comedy sequences with promotional stills issued in advance of a film's release. In the case of the gibberish song, the difficult nighttime shoot for this great moment, and Chaplin's anxiety over the recording of his own voice, certainly contributed to the fact that no stills exist. Nevertheless, it's rare to have so much surviving photographic documentation from a film of this period, and its importance is doubled by the fact that Chaplin was so reluctant to discuss his work methods and choices. One of the most reproduced images from a Hollywood film is the still of the tramp becoming literally caught up in the tyranny of the machine age. It has become a symbol of the fight for individuality and humanity in a mechanized world. Images of the tramp with the gamine walking hand in hand down the open road at the film's conclusion are justly famous as well. The still photographs heightens one's understanding of Chaplin's art in a way production documents cannot. In the absence of the film outtakes, the still photographs are a vital record of the making of one of Chaplin's greatest and most enduring works.